Well, thank you very much to both of the presenters. I have to tell you that I, I figured he could have a little extra time because it took longer for the words to come down into the microphone. So he, it obviously was. Yes, exactly. Yes. Questions? Shelley. Um, great presentations, uh, both of you. Um, and it, it's, it seems to me that what we've been hearing the last couple of days is what we're all striving towards is a change in culture, bottom line. Whether we're talking about the culture of our schools, the culture of our work sites, and ultimately the culture of our communities, all of which are intertwined and, and, and more. Um, Allison, thank you for, for your work. Obviously, I'm integrally involved with uh, most of what you were talking about with the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition, and both our Presidential Youth Fitness Program and the Let's Move Active Schools. And the work that you're now doing and getting dollars out to the, every state is phenomenal, by the way. Um, do we feel like there are, um, there are now, or will there be more data sets that will help us identify and look for those schools or, the, or those communities, but really the, the schools in this case, that are implementing the comprehensive school physical activity model. Well, do we have data now? Will we have more data as this dollar, these dollars get rolled out? Right, thank you so much for that question. So um, one of the data points that I did Oh, I can't use my hands and hold the microphone. Um, one of the data points that I uh, did point out was CDC School Health Profiles data, where I showed the percent of schools in a state that were getting at a comprehensive. It was a, a um, it was a composite variable of some components of a multi of a comprehensive school physical activity program. Um, the good news is for the so that was 2012 data for the 2014 uh, questionnaire. We actually added three additional questions on um, whether the school had engaged in an assessment, whether or not the. Um, the uh, before school physical activity and then as well as family engagement and so that data is going to be out later this year um, and that's state level data on percent of schools and then we're also um, national data um, later this year will come out with the school health policies and practices study um, and that's school and classroom level data uh, I'm not we have a number of questions related to uh, physical activity across the school day and before and after school. So I, I have a feeling we're going to be working with that data to, again, make a composite variable at that national level. Um, and then in addition, in terms of like, are, are, you also, are you also asking, like, how do we identify a specific school? Uh, no. Okay, no. just more so the data yeah, sets. Yeah, looking at the yes. data sets. And, and if I could, and, and forgive me if I missed this in one of the earlier conversations, but... Um, I hope that all of my fellow roundtable members, number one, and, and all of those listening, are truly understanding what Allison has presented in terms of the comprehensive model. We call it CSPAP, Comprehensive School Physical Activity Model. And just like in any comprehensive program, you cannot pick one of those bubbles up there. You have to have all of them in order for us to truly change culture. And you saw the big red one in the middle that was physical education. And um, I really hope that we will understand that physical activity is not physical education. And it sure as hell isn't gym class, which was talked about earlier. And if you would allow me one more 30 seconds, um, I want to read you the definition of physical education uh, from our friends at Shape America. Is Paul still here? Oh, thank you, Paul. Um, so from Shape America, physical education provides students with a planned, sequential, K through 12, standards-based program of curricula and instruction designed to develop motor skills, knowledge and behaviors for active living, knowledge and behaviors for active living, physical fitness, sportsmanship, self-efficacy, and emotional intelligence. That's what physical education is. It's what it should be, what it needs to be. 
Physical activity is how we practice that. So I really want us to understand it. And when I go out across the country, people do not understand the difference between PA and PE. So when we talk about policies, as we did earlier, about the big d debate on what to put in our policy, should it be PA or PE, these are big discussions, right? So I, thank you for allowing me to say that, and thank you for all your great work. Oh, thank you so much, Shelley. And I do want to point out that um, the Institute of Medicine did publish the report on educating the student body, and I believe there are free copies when you exit the auditorium if you would like to um, acquire that as well. And that reinforces that point that Shelley is making. So thank you. Let's hear from Iowa, finally. Uh, Iowa again, actually. Shelley's from Dubuque. I'm from Iowa, too. Um, and, and, we, um, and, and we didn't plan these two questions, but I'm very interested in one of those bubbles, physical education. I'd like to know what you all are doing to train, to help the universities and colleges train the next generation of physical educators. Um, well, one of the uh, work that we're doing specifically in, at CDC is um, we provide train the training, training of trainers on the comprehensive school physical activity program. So actually specifically on that report that I pulled out, uh, that I highlighted on um, a guide to schools and the development, implementation, and uh, evaluation of comprehensive school physical activity programs, we have an all-day workshop that we've developed, and we um, market it is right now it's currently being marketed to our uh, state health department grantees so that they can go out and uh, train the trainers but also the American Cancer Society we work with them um, to they do uh, Institute of um, higher I am trying to remember the correct name, but every, every few years they actually do trainings for um, Edge, uh, university staff on all of our tools and release resources related to school health and these are all day workshops and um, we train them to go out and do the training so for example last year I did a training to um, 20 university staff on our CDC school health guidelines to promote healthy eating and physical activity and then they would then incorporate that into their curriculum their teaching curriculum and then they also are empowered to go train um, that uh, train districts and schools on that tool Thank you. We have two more questions. Uh, Bill Dietz, Roundtable member. Uh, thank you both for these presentations. Uh, Allison, I, I should know the answer to this, but can SHIPS be linked to YRBS data? And for those of you in the audience, it's the School Health Policy and Programs linked to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey from those same schools so that you could actually have a, a, a measure, an outcome measure of physical activity or, or whatever uh, that you could link back to the degree to which these schools have implemented these policies. So um, the short answer is yes, because um, there are a couple manuscripts that are in place with um, doing that aspect. Um, but that would be something I would connect you with um, or any researchers that are interested in it with our sister division that lead those surveillance programs for the how. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, that can be done. Thanks, too, for two excellent presentations. Nico, I was wondering, Ted Kyle uh, with the round table, um, I was wondering, Nico, if there's any data out there on uh, interventions to reduce uninterrupted sitting time at work. Yeah, and actually, uh, we touched on that yesterday as well. There are, there, I would call it an emerging uh, set of, uh, of, of studies that have really started to look at the cross-sectional association between prolonged sitting time and poor outcomes in the context of workers. Um, and then a, a, a small set of intervention studies that I would call pilot studies at this point um, that start to look at permissive activity, uh, activity permissive uh, workstation design. So a sedentary worker who can then either stand up in place, walk in place, or pedal in place uh, to, to break up this uh, uninterrupted sitting time. And those, I would say those, those small studies are uh, promising. They all are very consistently um, in terms of their effect size as well as their, uh, their, their outcomes, health-related outcomes. But, but they are not necessarily at the, the strength of evidence where you could you know, 
where you could say, okay, well, this is a, a done deal. So there is a lot more need in that area to, to learn more about particularly the context in which these programs will be optimized. So one, there is, for example, a set of studies that look at uh, just the use of a device alone, like a sit-stand device. But actually, when you couch that in training and supervisor support, manager support, and some other workplace-specific context, then you can really enhance the outcomes and the use of those devices over time. So it's those kinds of things that we need to learn much more about. But I would say uh, that that literature is showing great promise. Well, thank you to both of you. And sorry there wasn't time for another question. <laughs>